Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Monday morning Karis Live Bible Study. And happy Valentine's Day, whether you're uh, in a relationship or you're courting, or even if you're single, just know that you are loved very, very much. And uh, God loves you more than you'll know. So keep that in mind today. And uh, not just today, every day. So little, a little love nugget for today. So happy Valentine's Day to everyone. <laughs> Um, so we're live. Let me go through a couple of announcements. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Ricky. We've had a good giggle this morning, so we're kind of a little bit uh, unfocused this morning. Um, but uh, yes, you're going to hear from our awesome Ricky Birch this morning. Um, but I'm going to go through a few announcements first for those of you who aren't familiar how our show works. So we're live five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday. Mondays and Fridays is 10 a.m. in the morning. Tuesdays and Thursdays, 6 p.m. in the evening. And then Wednesdays is 7 a.m. again in the morning, uh, bright and early. And that's all mountain time. So hopefully you can calculate from wherever you're watching in the world. And um, yes, if you have questions or if Ricky says something today that triggers a question on your heart, we would love for you to interact with us. So if you are watching this live, you can interact. And just go to the platform on whatever... Um, Sorry, go to the chat section on whatever platform you're watching on and you can submit your question there. And then uh, the last 10 to 15 minutes, we're going to answer as many questions as we can. And uh, you guys always submit the most amazing questions. I love it when they come through. So uh, go ahead and submit them. If you need prayer for anything, our prayer team is open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And uh, do not be alone going through anything. You pick up that phone and you call 719-635-1111 and one of our prayer uh, team members would love to pray with you. We also have over 200,000 hours of resources and materials on all different topics and issues of life. So just ask them about that and I know they can send you something that will really bless you. So now my announcement's over. I'm going to hand this over to Ricky. Hi, Ricky. Hi, Claire. So Ricky's our third year manager. For those of you who uh, don't know his title, um, he's awesome. He's fun. Like I said earlier, we had a real good giggle before we started the show. And uh, Ricky, you want to tell them what you were laugh what you were talking about? Um, how much I support women's rights. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. I'm going to let you run with that one. But, okay. Uh, yeah, we were, we were having a good giggle. So. I'm enjoying to see what you're going to bring for us today. All right, yeah. praise the Lord. <clears throat> so happy Valentine's, everybody. <clears throat> um, today I want to talk about the subject of walking with God and just talking about what does it look like for you and I to walk with God on a daily basis. I know that um, a lot of people may um, promote spending time with God or having devotional time with God or different things, but really I think one of the things that I've learned and God is steadily teaching me is that God wants to live with us. God wants to walk with us. Like everything we do, we should be doing it together. Um, God and us are not independent of each other. We are one. The Bible says in, I think, 1 Corinthians 6, 17, that he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So that means that there's never a time when I'm independent of God. We are one. And so we have a shared life. The spirit of God in me is making alive my mortal body continuously. And so we must learn how to live together with God and not just, you know, seek him in moments or delegate certain uh, amounts of time for him. But we should just learn to live with him when I'm cooking, when I'm eating, when I'm driving, when I'm exercising, when I'm whatever I may doing, I should do it with God. I should be living with God. And so let's look at Enoch. And as far as I know, Enoch's the only person where it explicitly says that he walked with God. And I really just want to look at Enoch's life a little bit and break it down and see what can we learn from him and apply for ourselves today. So I'm going to start in Genesis chapter 5, uh, verse 24. Genesis chapter 5, verse 24 says, And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. And there's a few words I want to look at. I want to look at Enoch's name, I want to look at walked, and I want to look at took. All right, first of all, Enoch, his name means dedicated. All right, and so a lot of people may look at his life and say, man, Enoch, how did he walk with the Lord all this time? 
I'm very sure that God wasn't in a visible, physical presence walking with Enoch all the days of his life. God, Enoch walked with an invisible person for hundreds of years until he was taken away. And so one of the interesting things um, and one of the keys we can get for how he was able to do that is his name. He embodies the name of dedication. And so we can say that um, Enoch was a very dedicated person. Like he was a loyal, faithful person. Once he was introduced to the Lord, he never walked away. He, he kind of stayed close to the Lord. And so um, God walks with everyone, but not everyone walks with God. Like when you see Adam and Eve and you can see like um, how they left from the Garden of Eden. Well, God left the Garden of Eden as well and has been following mankind since that time. And even when you look at your life and you say, wow, the moment I got born again, that's not the moment that God entered your life. He's been, the, uh, Jesus told the disciples, he says, the Holy Spirit has been with you and now he shall be in you. And so the Holy Spirit, God, has been with you all of your life. He's been, and because you may not have been aware of him, you've been just kind of navigating the world yourself. But that means that God, and, you know, this is kind of hard to say, but God has been following you all of your life until waiting for the moment where he can get to the place where he can lead you in your life. But before the moment where God is able to lead you, he has been following you. And God is never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. That means that even when we're not following him, he's following us because he's not going to leave us. He's not going to withdraw from us. He's not going to forsake us. So that means that everyone, um, God walks with everyone, but not everyone walks with God. And so Enoch was dedicated to God's path for his life. He was committed to the path that God had revealed for his life. And when we look at this word walked, this is very interesting. It appears 500 times in the Old Testament. But 217 times, it is translated as go. And so it, when it, the text, when it's really, what it's really saying is it's not just that Enoch walked with God, but that Enoch went with God, which is a huge difference. It's one thing to walk with God. We can walk with God around, on a treadmill. We can walk with God going around the same mountain just like the children of Israel did. Just because I'm walking with someone doesn't mean I'm actually making progress with that person. But Enoch, it's really saying that Enoch went with God. In other words, Enoch went into the direction that God was taking him. Mm. Enoch wasn't just together with God, but Enoch was cooperating with God. He was making progress with God. He was moving with God. He was taking steps of action with God. He went where God led him. He went where the Lord took him to. And so the, the, the Bible says that Enoch went where God was leading him until he made the transition. And so even you and I, we can look at our lives and say, man, I, maybe I feel stuck or maybe I feel like no, I'm not making progress or maybe I feel like life is just the same. I, I wake up every day, day after day, year after year, and it's like there's nothing new really happening. I'm not really seeing um, uh, achievement and, and, and progress. And so what he's saying is that you can walk with God. You can walk with God in a circle. But Enoch wasn't walking with God in a circle. Enoch went with God in a straight line. Right. He went on a path. He there was a destination that God was taking Enoch and Enoch went with God to that destination. So very huge difference. Um, everybody can walk with God. But how many people went with God? Right. And so we see that Enoch, um, it says that um, and Enoch was not because God took him. All right. That's a very interesting word. It's the same word we get in Genesis 2:21, when it says uh, the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed it up and um, closed up the flesh in his place. And so what we can see is that God took Enoch out of this fallen world and Enoch never died. So what can we learn from this? We can learn, number one, that walking with God allows us to avoid death. Right. Walking with God allowed Enoch to avoid literal death. But when we walk with God at some point, you may not know exactly when it's going to happen. You may not even be conscious of when it's happening. But at some point, you are going to be removed and taken out of dead situations, dead relationships and dead end scenarios. Right. When we walk with God, we are taken out of something. Right. That's what it means to be. He, he didn't just walk. He went with God. So if I went with God, that means I'm leaving a place. So God is, if I'm going with God, 
I'm moving forward with God, that means I'm leaving some things behind. And what am I leaving behind? Dead situations, dead relationships, dead in scenarios where you know in your heart that you know how this is going to end. You know this isn't going to work. You know this isn't going to, this isn't, there's no life in this thing. You know that there's an expiration date on it. You know that maybe you've delayed in something for too long, but you just don't maybe have the courage or the tenacity to kind of break free out of that thing. But what happens is when we walk with God, when we go where he's taking us, that, that the pull on the Lord is stronger than the pull on these dead things that are trying to hold us back, right? The, mag, the magnetic strength on where God is taking us is stronger than the magnetic strength on the thing that's trying to hold us down, you know? The, the resurrection life of God is stronger than the pull of the grave. And so when we walk with God, we are taken out of and we are removed from a lot of dead things. And so God prunes us so that he can take away the things which are dead in our lives so he can give room for more fruit, more growth, more life, more blessing, more goodness, right? That's awesome. Yeah. And so let's look at Hebrews 11, verse 5, still talking about Enoch. Okay. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken away, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Um, that Enoch, um, that he pleased God. And so he, why did, how did Enoch please God? Well, we know in the next verse it talks about without faith it's impossible to please God. So faith is what pleases God, right? So we can see that Enoch pleased God because he trusted God, right? The reason that Enoch pleased God, the thing that made God happy, the thing that God enjoyed most about Enoch is that Enoch was a man that trusted God. Mm. And when you look at a relationship, like what's one of the most satisfying things you can have in a relationship with someone. It's when they trust you. Absolutely. It's when they believe you. It's when you tell them something and they take you at your word. It's when someone else can come around behind your back or on the side somewhere and they can try to slander your name, but this person trusts you, they believe you, and they won't give heed to slander or gossip or anything like yeah. that. And so that's the thing that really blessed the Lord about Enoch is that, man, here's a man that actually trusts me. Like out of all the millions of people in the world, here's one that actually believes me. He actually trusts me. And he's not just walking with me in circles, but he's going with me where I'm taking him. And that really pleased God. It really blessed him. You ever think about, a, maybe, let's say, a husband-wife relationship or um, boyfriend-girlfriend relationship, whatever it may be, even a pastor-congregation relationship? Uh, leader follower relationship and you may see like okay someone's trying someone may see more than the other person does and they're trying to lead the other person with limited sight into a place but because the person can't see exactly what the the person in front of them sees they struggle to 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 follow and so the only remedy for that is when you trust the person that's leading you because you can't see what they see mm. But when you are trying to lead someone to a certain place, but they won't trust you, it breaks your heart. It's like, why won't you trust me? Why don't you believe me? Why won't you let me take you? Don't you know that I have your best interests at heart? Don't you know that I'm trying to lead you into a place that's good for you and that's, this is better for you than where you currently are? And so when God saw that Enoch actually trusted him because he demonstrated it by going with God wherever God took him, that blessed God's heart. It pleased God. And so we can see that today, 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. So it's the same thing. Like Enoch didn't have a visible presence of God. He didn't, he wasn't physically holding God's hand. He couldn't, um, he didn't, it's not like God woke up with him and lived with him in his house. That's not what happened. But there was a, 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 a spiritual connection that Enoch had with God. And so um, it takes faith to walk with an invisible God. And it takes faith to trust that where God is taking you is better than where you are. Mm. And so what pleases God, if I could put it in one sentence, is when we allow him to take us where he wants us to go. That makes God happy. When we allow God permission and authority in our lives to lead us and take us places that he would want us to be, that makes him happy because he knows what's best for us. He's like, man, you're satisfied with this thing right here. You're satisfied with this person right here. You're satisfied with this situation. This, uh, you know, like, man, there's so much more for you. You know, you're satisfied in Egypt. Then you're satisfied in the wilderness, but I've got a whole territory, a whole nation 
with milk and honey and grapes you have to carry on your shoulders and there's even houses that you won't even have to build because people were there but I'm going to re remove them so like there's water and there's like it's a very fertile place why are you satisfied in Egypt why are you satisfied in um you know the wilderness and so what hap what pleases God is when we enter our promised land right what pleases God is when we enter our sweet spot in life what makes God happy is when we get to the place where we thrive and we fully come alive and, um, and, uh, that, and it takes faith in order to do that. So let's look at um, Amos chapter 3, verse 3. Amos chapter 3, verse 3. <clears throat> um, this is a familiar scripture. It says, can two people walk together or can two walk together unless they are agreed? Can they walk together unless there's some kind of agreement? So that word walk is talking about causing to run. It's talking about a flow, a march, all right? So how, how can we flow with God? How can we run with God? Because it's not literally walking, but it's Enoch went with God. And there's a pace that all of us can went with God, if I could say it that way, right? Some people may went with God slowly. Some people may went with God quickly. There's different paces that we can move together and go together with God. Um, but, but God's thing is that he, would want, he wants to cause us to run, right? So it doesn't mean that everything has to take a long time with the Lord. It doesn't mean that everything has to take years and ages before you see progress. But God's like, I'll walk with you at your pace. Isn't that beautiful that he does that? It is. Yes. There's no demanding on, hey, come on, get yourself ship shape. Exactly. You know, there's benefits for us yeah. to ship shape up. But yep. he's such a gentleman that he will... It's like with a little toddler learning to walk. You exactly. slow down and hold their hand. Exactly. Isn't that beautiful? Yep. Yes. With a yeah. toddler, you have to slow down. <laughs> Sometimes with older people, you may have to slow down. But then with, let's say, teenage boys, you're not going to slow them down because you know they've got the right. horsepower, to, so you'll run with them. So really, God relates with us. He walks with us. He paces out our steps according to our ability to keep up with him. And that's incredible. We've got a God that's not just driving us. He's mm. not pushing us. He's not forcing us, but he's walking together with us at our pace. And anybody who's ever walked with someone, you know um, that if you're walking with someone, you're going to have to settle at a pace um, because you can't walk with two different paces and still be together, right? Because somebody's going to be in front of the other or behind the other. or So you have to both agree on a pace, and that's what keeps you together as you walk. And so it's the same thing with God. He comes into our life and he identifies the pace we are able to walk with and he agrees with that pace and he walks with us until we either increase the pace, slow down the pace, whatever we do, but he's going to adjust and respond to our pace. Mm. And that is awesome. Yes. I mean, that's a very, there's a scripture in Isaiah 11 talks about how the spirit of the Lord shall be upon Jesus, the spirit of wisdom and counsel and might, and then there's a spirit of understanding. And so when you see the spirit of, that's, when you see Jesus, Jesus is a very understanding God. He understands you and I. Mm. God is a God of understanding. He made you with his own hands. He knows how frail you may be. He knows the the circumstances you're coming out of. He knows the strongholds that are in your mind. He knows the experiences you've had. He knows how you see the world and everything. And so he understands. And he's not in a rush to push you or to prod you or he's not irritated. He's not impatient. He's very long suffering. And he understand. And the reason he could be that way, one of the reasons is because he's so understanding of who we are as individuals. Yeah. And I love the fact that God doesn't, you know, when you're a shepherd, you have to kind of do things as a group, right? A group of sheep or a group of cattle or a group of whatever, right? But God can shepherd us one by one. It's so incredible. Like he doesn't just, um, he doesn't just relate to us as a group. He doesn't just relate to us as a herd, mm. right? He doesn't just relate to us as a whole, but God is able to relate to us individually, one by one, person by person, yeah. and completely understanding that individual person and still allowing them to keep up with the group. It's yeah. incredible. Even when we're off that little sheet that's got its head stuck in a fence somewhere. Exactly. He's like, I'm coming for you. Exactly. <laughs> yep. And so God is incredible. That's yep. why he can leave the 99 to get the Amen. one because he recognizes yep. the one's gone. Yeah. Many shepherds, if you had 100 sheep and one left, you wouldn't even know that it's gone. But God is so individually involved in our lives that he can see, man, there's one missing, right? Because he's focused on all of us together. Yeah. So it's really incredible. And then when you look at that word agree, when it says, uh, you know, can two walk together unless they agree? 
Well, it means to assemble, to meet by appointment, but the one I really love, it means to engage for marriage. And it was actually translated betrothed or engaged twice in the Old Testament, hmm. Exodus 21, verse 8 and 21, verse 9. Um, and so what God, going back to Enoch, whose name means dedicated, right? Enoch was able to walk with God because he was dedicated, right? He was able to run with God, to, to, to move with God because he was dedicated to that relationship. It was like, no matter what happens in my life, I'm going to maintain my connection with you, Jesus. Like, no matter what happens, when it's good times, bad times, times that I understand, times I don't understand, when there's things in my life that are helping me, when there's things in my life that are hurting me, when I'm surrounded by friends or surrounded by enemies, I'm going to maintain my dedication to Jesus. I'm going to maintain my connection to the Lord because all these things are temporary. They may go up, they may go down. Life happens, but I have to keep Jesus. I have to keep holding his hand. And so Enoch was able to walk with God so long because he agreed with God. He was engaged with God. And then God took him and said, let's get married right now. He just was, there was no more Enoch. All right, so let's talk about getting off of the treadmill. Because like I said, we can be walking, but are we, have we went with God, right? Mm. Deuteronomy chapter one, verses six to seven. Deuteronomy chapter one, verses six to seven. It says, the Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, you have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey. Go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowland, in the south and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. So what we can see is that the children of Israel were walking with God. They were, but they were walking in circles around the same mountain. Right. And when we read, you know, Exodus, Deuteronomy, Leviticus, we see like okay, numbers. Right. We, we're, what we see is that uh, they would station for a place, then they would walk and then they station for. And it's just the same thing over mm -hmm. and over and over for 40 years. Well, isn't it? Wouldn't it normally have taken a week to get out of the wilderness? I think it was 11 days journey. OK. And they were there for 40 years. 40 yeah. years. <laughs> it took an 11 day journey and they turned it into 40 years. And here's the issue is that they were walking with God. And that's why I want to make the distinction. It's not that Enoch just walked with God, but he went with God. It's a very important distinction. Yeah. See, the children of Israel were walking with God in, around the same mountain. They were visiting the same places. They were stuck, but they were stuck in, in you know, they still had movement. And that's very interesting. You can be stuck and still have movement like a treadmill. You're walking, you're expending energy, you're moving, you're burning calories, but you're not actually on a track of life. You're not actually running the race of life. You're on a treadmill. And God wants to take us off of the treadmill like the children of Israel and not just walk with God, because that means we could even be walking in the same, you know, around the same mountain, but he wants us to went with God, which means we get off of the treadmill and we get on the track and we start running the race of life and we start hitting laps and we start making progress. See, you don't, uh, the race of life cannot be quit. It has to be completed. And the children of Israel never got a chance to even get into the race of life because they were stuck on this treadmill. But God says, I want you to get off of the treadmill. You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. You've been walking in this same vicinity all of your, for 40 years. Yeah. Enough is enough. It's time for you to turn and take your journey. It's time for you to run the race of your life. And so, and so I think that's, that's amazing. We can't just walk, but we have to win. I keep saying, I hope that makes sense to everybody. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? Well, it does to me. All and right, I'm awesome. I'm quite smart. You yeah, know. I mean, you're <laughs> sharper than the average knife. <laughs> All right. So let's talk about holding God's hand, right? <clears throat> because uh, when we walk with God, let's talk about holding God's hand. The Bible talks about that in Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Okay. Isaiah 41, verse 10 says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God, and I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Mm. And this is an incredible, great scripture because you see a lot of I will. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you. You know, I am with you. And so this is a great scripture where God is talking about what he's going to do for us. And so walking with God is not only, it's a partnership. We walk together. And so God says that I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Now that word um, uphold is the same word from Exodus 17, 12, when it talks about Aaron and her. 
and it talks about how Moses' hand was getting too heavy and mm. he was getting tired. Yeah. And the, the word, it says that Aaron and her supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side. And I actually looked at her hands up because I thought maybe they supported his shoulder. In my mind, I always thought maybe they lifted up the elbow, but it says that they supported his hands. So the only way to do that is they, they put their hands in his hands and they literally held his hand up in their hand. And so what we can see is that they were holding hands and they were using their strength to keep his hand up because he wasn't strong enough. And that's what God is saying here is that he's going to uphold us. He's going to, to keep us up using his strength while we are holding his hand. Mm, that's awesome. And so, and so when you look at it, he says, um, the righteousness uh, of, of my right hand or I uphold you with my righteousness and my, or I forget how he said that. But when you look at it, Jesus is the righteousness of God and Jesus is at the right hand of God, right? So, so what we can see today is God is upholding us through the finished work of Jesus because Jesus is the righteousness of God and he's at the right hand of God. Amen. And so God helps, he strengthens, he upholds all of us through the finished work of the Lord Jesus. So the finished work of Jesus is what God uses to help us as we navigate life. So we, you and I, if we're going to hold God's hand, what does it mean? We have to hold on to everything that Jesus did for us as we take this journey, as we walk with God, as we went with God, right? So um, we really have to understand the grace of God gives us the ability to make progress with God. The grace of God gives us the ability to make to make a step in front of another step on this journey of life. And so we have to always maintain. And that's what the interesting thing about Enoch is, is that Enoch lived before the law. Enoch wasn't walking with God. It doesn't say um, by the law, Enoch pleased God. It says by faith, Enoch pleased God. Mm. See, Enoch was living under grace before the law ever came. And because Enoch trusted the Lord and 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 and, and put his reliance in the Lord, God supplied him with grace to be able to keep up and to be able to make those transitions in life. And so that's what we have, you and I have to do. Nobody can walk with God under the law. And so I'll just show you, um, and Gal I'm going to read two scriptures and put them together. So Galatians chapter three, verse 12, and then I'll read Romans 14, verse um, 23. So Galatians three twelve says, yet the law is not of faith, but the man who does them shall live by them. Okay, so the law is not a faith. Now, Romans 14, 23 says, But he who doubts is condemned if he eats, because he does not eat from faith. For whatever is not from faith is sin. Okay, so whatever is not of faith is sin, and the law is not of faith. Hmm. So the law is not of faith, hmm. and whatever is not of faith is sin. All right, so that word sin is talking about missing the mark. That's what it literally means, to be off target. So what it's saying is when you and I try to use the law to connect with God, to walk with God, to interact with God, we are always going to miss him because the law can never help us hit the target. The law is not a faith. The law is sin. The law will help. We're going to miss the target. We're going to be off the mark. And so we have to understand that it's through the grace of God and it's through our faith, which is our cooperation with God. It's our positive response to what God wants to do in our life that helps us to enjoy this walk, that helps us to, 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 to compete in this race, that helps us to make progress in life. And so a lot of times we may relate to God based on, am I performing? Have I done enough? Am I Am I worthy of this or that? And, and like sometimes it's just a default belief system that we have just because of how long the law has been around and just because of how society works. It's always performance based. It's if you do this, then you'll get that. And yeah. if you don't do that, then you can't have that. But God's not like that. God doesn't relate to us that way. You know, God is saying that the law, if you're using the law to connect with me, you're always going to miss me because I'm not using the law in my relationship with you. I'm using the finished work of Jesus to uphold you. 
And if you hold on to what Jesus did, that he fulfilled the very law that you could not fulfill, that he condemned, he nailed that very law to the cross in Colossians chapter 2 that is condemning you. Everything that condemns you and speaks bad about you, Jesus fulfilled and then he nailed it to the cross. So the law doesn't, see Jesus has, uh, his blood speaks better things than the blood of Abel. And so he satisfied the, the wrath of God on your behalf. And so you can't come to God in your own strength. You have to come to him in the name of Jesus. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus and not in our own name, mm. because we come to him not on our own merit, but on the merit of Jesus. The Bible says no man comes to the Father. Uh, Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except through him. So we come to the Father. We walk with the Father through Jesus, through the finished work of Jesus. That's what we hold on to as the Lord takes us on our journey. Amen. Okay, so let's just, do we have time? Yes. Let's look at three things very quickly that can hinder us from walking with God. I just want to look at three different things that can, could, and these are things that I've seen in my own life. There may be more, but um, if we can overcome these things, I think we can make a lot of progress with the Lord. So, number one, a fear of where God is taking us. Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 58. So it happened as they journeyed on the road that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. All right. So what I learned from this scripture is that home is wherever the will of God takes us. My home is wherever the will of God takes me. I shouldn't be looking for a hole like a fox. I shouldn't be looking for a nest like a bird. But the son of man has no place to lay his head. It doesn't mean he didn't have a home. He had plenty of homes. He had, Jesus had a treasury, and Judas was the treasurer out of all things. And Judas, Judas used to steal money from it. Yep. So imagine you've got a treasurer where you've got 12 people that you have to take care of, grown men with families, and one of them is stealing from it, and you still have enough money to take care of them, to travel all these journeys and all of this stuff. Like, Jesus had money. But he's not saying that he doesn't have a place to lay his head. He's saying that my home is not like a fox or a bird. I'm not like an animal. I don't look for a hole or a nest, but my home is wherever the will of God takes me, right? And so we have to um, kind of resolve that in our hearts is that, okay, God's not just going to put me in a hole somewhere or he's not going to just put me in a nest somewhere. <laughs> yeah. I'm not looking for a physical location. The, my location is the will of God. And wherever the will of God takes me, that has become my home. Because you're going to be taken care of. Exactly. Wherever you go. You're with him. Yes. And wherever you are with him, if you're with him in his will, then that's your home. Mm. And so a lot of times we may be, look, we were like, where, God, where are you taking me, God? We're looking for a hole, right? We're looking for a nest. Like, where am I going to end up? Where is my life going to? And it's God, Jesus is like, stop thinking like that. And just be free to move with me wherever I may take you. Those who are born of the Spirit are like the wind. You may not know where they're coming from. You may not know where they're going, but you, you just know that there's a flow. You just know that there, there, there's life there. There's refreshing there. And so that's how we have to be. Our home is wherever the will of God takes us. Don't box God in to how you want him to move in your life. Isaiah 43, verse 1 to 2. But now, thus says the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. So here's the thing. It doesn't say that God's not going to lead us through the river. And it doesn't say that God's not going to lead us through the fire. No, he is. But when we go through the river, we won't drown. And when we go through the fire, we won't be burned. So here's the thing is that you cannot be afraid of the path that God has you on. You have to embrace that path. No matter how scary it may look, no matter how dangerous it may look, no matter how it may, it may seem like, man, my life's going to be over if I make this decision or if I really obey Lord and the Lord and do what I believe he's asking me to do, man, this is going to be a disaster. But it's like, this is the way to your destiny. You know, it may not look like it, but God knows the end from the beginning. Mm -hmm. He's very far in front of you. And he knows that this is the path that you must take for your victory. This is the path you must go through for your destiny. And so, David, you've got to have the lion, the bear, Goliath, Saul, the Philistines. You've got to have all of that stuff. This is the path for your destiny. 
Joseph, you're going to have to go to be put in a hole by your brothers and then uh, be sold as a slave and then put in prison. Then you'll reach the palace. That is the path. You're, so, yes, Joseph, you're going to go through the river and the fire, but you won't be drowned and you won't be burned, right? Mm -hmm. We cannot be afraid of the path to our destiny that God has us on. We have to trust the Lord. All right, here's number two, uh, that sometimes we're afraid of being misunderstood. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 4 to 5, it says, For I know nothing of my, against myself, yet I am not justified by this, but he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore, judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. All right, judge nothing before the time. You know, sometimes when you walk with the Lord, you can be misunderstood. People may think, oh, man, you're crazy, or, oh, man, you are radical, or, oh, man, you are religious, or, oh, man, like, it's not that serious. You don't have to. And so in that moment, or they may look at it in that moment and see, man, man, you're failing. This may not be God. This, you, maybe you've missed it, or, but you can't judge something before the time. You have to allow the time to have its perfect work. You have to allow things to run its full course before you make a judgment, before you make a decision. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes God's going to take us through different seasons and things in our lives where it doesn't make sense to people around us, and it may not make sense to us, but we have to be careful not to make decisions about what God is doing before it runs its full course. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things that can keep us off of the path or can keep us stuck going in the same mountain because we have decided before the time what God is doing. And, um, you know, you look at Andrew, man, he said for years people stayed away from his meetings by the thousands. But now you see it's run its course and now he's impacting nations. See, he didn't judge himself before the time. He didn't make a decisions about what God was doing in his life before the time. All right. Um, all right, do we have time for one, or it's not We're time? Seven minutes left of the show. Okay, but we got questions. We do have questions. Okay, I'm going to do super fast. Okay. We all know about wisdom is justified by her children. That's what Jesus told about John the Baptist. He says, you know, you, you're the son of man came eating and drinking. You say, look, he's a glutton and a wine bibber, friend of tax collectors and sinners, right? And um, he says, but wisdom is justified by her children. In other words, you're going, you are misunderstanding, but wisdom is going to be justified on the other side of my life, on the other side of the cross. See, the cross, the foolish, the cross looks foolish, but the resurrection proves that it wasn't. Mm. You know, it's, yeah, you may go through the cross and it may look like you're being humiliated. It may look like your life's not amounting to something. But on the other side of the cross is the resurrection, and the resurrection stands for all time. And it says that because of that, Jesus has a name above every name is like it's never going to change. And so I just have to you just have to know that wisdom, what you're doing, the wisdom of it may not be seen today, but it will be seen on the other side of it when things run its full course. Amen. And the final thing I'll say, Matthew 7, 13 to 14, is that sometimes we can be afraid to be alone. Right. We can be we're, sometimes we're afraid of where God's taking us. Sometimes we're afraid of being misunderstood. And the final one is sometimes we're afraid to be alone. Matthew 7, 13 and 14, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it because, the, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. So sometimes you may have to walk alone when you walk with God. God will put you on a path where sometimes you are the minority, but most of the time trailblazers are misunderstood. Um, Amen. And so I would just say that it's true that you may lose people on the way. It's true that some people may not go with you where God is taking you. Everyone can't go with you where God is taking you. But um, don't be afraid to be alone. Don't be afraid to lose people. Keep staying true to the path that God has you on, and wisdom will be justified by our children. Because you're not accounting yourself to anybody else. That's right. But him. That's right. That, so, yeah. That's awesome. Thank Ricky, this is so good. I love I love the way you teach. I love Thank what you, you teach. I'm, I know you guys have been blessed too. Excited, We've had a lot of good questions come in. Okay, All right. Let's do it. Okay. Samaya on YouTube is asking, she says, we tend to pour our lives into working for God, like ministry wise, mm -hmm. and we see that building our relation, uh, relationship with God. So is it possible to work for God and not walk with Him? Oh, exactly. <laughs> so M Martha and Mary, um, is it Luke chapter 10 or Luke chapter 11 somewhere? 
where it says that Martha wanted to cook and clean and do all this stuff mm -hmm. um, that, you know, women do sometimes, yeah. you know, <laughs> just when a man walks in the house. Ne you never require that, do you? <laughs> no, you I never, never require that. It. I'm just saying, that's what Martha was doing. <laughs> so, look, Martha was trying to serve Jesus. She wanted to work for Jesus. But Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, and yeah. she was just being humble and receiving from him. So, yes, there's a difference. A lot of people think that working for Jesus is the same as walking with Jesus, but it's not. And so that's the, uh, a very strong distinction. Mary has chosen the better part. Mary has chosen that which cannot be taken away from her. And so I think that we have to make that distinction. You can work with, and I would even say this, the Lord doesn't want us to work for him. He wants us to work with him because we're co-laborers with Christ. And so we don't work for Jesus. We work with Jesus as we walk with Jesus. So that's what I would mm. recommend, that the things you do for the Lord come out of your relationship with him. Yes. But you're not doing things for the Lord so that you can earn relationship. That's with how him. burnout happens, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Um, okay, T. Marie on Facebook asks, I believe, it, I believe spiritual growth is important and it's my part to continue growing. However, is it possible to outgrow a church? Yes. Yes, it is. I don't know if I have any scriptures for that, but yes, it's true. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if your church is not growing and they're teaching the same sermons, excuse me, every Sunday and every Wednesday, singing the same songs, and there's no, there's like the, the church itself is not growing, but you as an individual is growing, then of course, at some point, you're going to outgrow that community. And it's a sad fact, but yes, it does happen. Mm. It, it, and it's a harsh reality. Yeah. Um, okay. I think it's Midge on chat. I apologize if I have butchered that. Um, this one's a little bit heartbreaking. Um, Midge says, I have no patience. I am so sick and it's not improving. Mm. I keep getting in God's face about when I will be healed. Even though I know that it's not good, I can't stop it. How do I stop? Yeah, I think that... Um we well, see he upholds us with his righteous right hand, the finished work of, of the Lord Jesus. And one of the things Jesus did for you that you can hold on to as you navigate this season of your life, which is a season of you're being attacked by sickness. One of the f things that Jesus did for you is that by his stripes, 1 Peter 2.24, you were past tense already healed. So the same cross that forgives you is the same cross that heals you. And just like you can receive forgiveness of sin today just by believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth, you can receive that healing which is already prepared for you just by believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. Uh, there's a scripture, I think it's in 2 Corinthians 4 somewhere. It says, we have the same spirit of faith just as we have believed, therefore we speak. And so you have to believe, like when you speak to your mountain, right? If you doubt, don't doubt in your heart, you will have what you say. So you have to believe first in your heart that I'm already healed, that this is already done, that everything I need to be free and to break loose of this healing has already been done for me. And you meditate on that until you are fully persuaded of it in your heart. Mm -hmm. And then as you believe, therefore you speak, then you release your faith, you speak to your mountain, and that, those words that are full of faith and, and backed by the authority of Jesus are going to accomplish what they were sent forth and they won't, won't, they won't return back void. And so, like, that's what I would really encourage you to do. Mm. Meditate on those truths and get it in your heart until you're fully persuaded and then speak. Whatever is going on in your body is going to listen to you when you use the name of Jesus um, in faith. Amen. And call our prayer line as well. Um, mm. If you need some scriptures, they can specifically give you scriptures to stand on if you're not sure, you know, which ones to stand on. Give them a call and they would love to pray with you and bless you with some more uh, spiritual weapons that you need. Oh, yeah. Um, one more. One more, very quickly. All right. Um, this is kind of similar. Uh, Deborah on Facebook asks, is it unbelief to keep going to the doctor for checkups when he has said that we are healed? Uh, might I be postponing the healing as one might be confronted with opposite evidence, which creates unbelief? Yeah, I mean, that's something that you have to take into your relationship with the Lord. I mean, there's no clear scripture that's going to give you an answer. It's according to your faith. Be it unto you according to your faith. And so if your faith is, I'll go to the doctor and get checkups just to so they can confirm the miracle that's happening in my body or just so that they can confirm what the Lord has done in my body, 
then that's fine. But if your faith is and your conviction is, I don't need to go to the doctor, I'm fully persuaded and I have a word from the Lord and I don't, I don't need another word from anyone else, you believe the report of the Lord and you don't need a report from the doctor, then you follow your faith in that um, path. But I would just say, be it unto you according to your faith, whatever you and the Lord agree upon, then that's what you need to walk out. Amen. Ricky, thank you very much Thanks, for today. I apologize once again. You know, there's so many questions that came in um, that we weren't able to get to all of them. But if you tune in on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock, we try and do like a, a weekly roundup of questions. So uh, one of our instructors will be here and answer as many questions that we can't get to uh, throughout the live Bible study. So hopefully yours will be answered then. And then one more thing before we go. Ricky's teaching our uh, Relationship University, and it's going to be live streamed today. Um, if you loved what he taught today, um, it's not necessarily the same subject, but he, you're such a good teacher. And if he's blessed you this morning, I encourage you guys to tune in at 1 o'clock. Um, you can go to Gospel Truth TV. I think it's on uh, Facebook and probably YouTube as well. But just look for Relationship University, 1 o'clock Mountain Time. You'll catch him teaching on some awesome stuff again today. Thank you, Claire. So thank you. Uh, God bless you guys. Have a wonderful day and live Bible study will be back tomorrow at 6 p.m. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV.